Hi, man. What's going on? Stressed out, man. Excels. <laughs> Talk me off usual. a ledge here. Yeah. I need your no. help. This will be a good one, man. I know we wanted to break down just kind of how stressful tech sales is, give people on the outside looking in a realistic look at what it takes. I think many more people than give themselves credit for could handle the stress of tech sales. But I do see people naively maybe coming into this that are blindsided by the stress and or I know something we've seen is people maybe work at a market leader, then go to a startup and it's completely different and become, you know, now they're working all the time. Many different things will break down and also comparing it to di different career paths as well. Um, any thoughts to set the stage for the combo? No, I think that sets it well. I think a lot of people come into tech sales and they have the mindset to manage the stress and others don't understand that it's not the type of job where it's from point A to point B, you know what the end goal is, you need to complete these tasks and once you do, you're done. In tech sales, there's risk in every deal cycle. Your job is to mitigate that risk as best as you can. but. There's gonna be times where you did everything right on paper, but something happens and it's outside of your control. And next thing you know, you're behind your number or not on pace for the year. And yeah, I think we're just gonna talk about how to handle those types of situations, manage stress that comes up and yeah. how we've thought about it in the past. Yeah, for sure. And I think also on, on top of that, talk about some of the things we do to maybe manage the stress load as well. I think that's a huge part. People get into this and they, there's a couple different symptoms, whether it's a very toxic environment, and mm -hmm. I, I don't, you know, we can definitely touch on that, but I also think, especially early on, it's it's like not knowing what you don't know. To your point, and something that's very weird to experience is as you get into bigger and bigger deals, as you do this more and more, there's so many variables outside of your control that impact whether or not you ultimately hit your number. And I would even say from my own life experience, leaving out tech sales for a moment, it's kind of like sports, right? like middle school, high school, if you find a sport that you enjoy, you're better than most of your peers or whatever it might be, it's a lot of fun and you can do it pretty easily. And I think the same thing about salespeople, you know, it's like when you're in high school or you're in college or whatever, and you have an extroverted personality or you have a large friend group, you're a social person, the concept of sales seems very approachable and like something you can do. But then when you're doing this full time, you know, 40 hours plus a week, every single day monday to friday it's a different game just like sports like when i got into training with team usa back in college training eight times a week is not pick up basketball four times a week with your buddies like yeah. we're doing the smallest details and unless you really you know are wanting to do that and s expel a significant amount of time and energy into that i think a lot of people maybe walk into this career a little bit willy-nilly and then all of a sudden they're literally expected to make 50 cold calls a day and they're mm -hmm. a social and friendly person but they haven't had to sit there at 2 30 when their caffeine is worn off and they're not feeling like doing this yet again and still doing it anyway yeah. and i think if you're not if you can't find that motivation, whether it's being a little bit of your own entrepreneur, whether it's the financial upside, those are all things that were big motivators for me coming from a very steady and boring job. If you just come in and have this idea that, all right, I'm in sales, so I'm going to make more money. I see a lot of people coming in with that mindset that just get blindsided by how difficult it really is. Yeah. So, yeah. I like the school analogy too, because yeah, in tech sales, you can have these key KPIs, like make 50 dials a day, make 50 emails a day, whatever it is, and you can do what's laid out for you, but not get the desired result and still be behind even though you were you did exactly what you were expected of. Like in school, if you studied hard enough or you knew the material well enough and you answered the questions in a certain way, you would get the score, the outcome that you desired, and it was pretty black and white. I think a lot of people are have that mentality conditioned in, to them from school, but then yeah when you get into the sales profession in particular, yeah. it's, a, it's a little bit of a different mindset. And I guess taking this into maybe one of the ways I've overcome anytime I've been stressed, I've found that the best way to combat that for me, if you have a brain like me, it's to figure out and understand what the key inputs are to what you're trying, to what the output you're trying to get. So like, let's take that SDR role, for example. Pipeline, that might be your key KPI, get a million dollars in pipeline, but reverse engineering. Okay, what do I need to get pipeline? Opportunities, okay, what do I need to get opportunities? Meetings, what do I need to get meetings? And figuring out, okay, how many calls do I need to make? How many emails do I need to make? How well is this template performing? In reverse engineering and controlling what I can control, I think that's where people get stressed out is when they haven't, and a lot of this sometimes is on, man. it's management's job to coach the reps as to what those inputs are. I think where people get stressed out is when they fall behind the metrics and their targets and they don't understand what the inputs are either. So they can't even focus on 
what they can control because they don't know what those key inputs are that they can control or at least they don't understand them. Yeah. Um, that's always been the best way for me is to just focus on the inputs, control what I can control. Yeah, for sure. And I think honestly, like I don't want to get too meta here, but that's why I think early on as best as possible going to a reputable brand. It doesn't even necessarily mean it has to be a market leader, but it could be a startup that actually has market fit. Um, like I think these things are really important because if, as an example, you go to some no-name startup and your first sales job ever, they don't have any training, they don't have any proven track record of any SDRs ever hitting quota, it's really difficult and you get completely overwhelmed. So I think like if you're in an environment, that's why I always encourage people early on to go to an environment where there's training and or you know a proven track record or a very strong market fit. Like we have someone that went to Rubrik, just IPO'd, was a startup, but like on a very clear trajectory, growth trajectory, et cetera. Um, and obviously like people like yourselves at Oracle, you can at least get the motion and comfort of like, yeah, you, you, you detach yourself from getting the output of 100% quota attainment. Mm -hmm. I think that's also really difficult to like, if, if you're getting into a performance-based career for the first time, like if you don't break it down into its smallest parts like you just outlined, the psychology of this is every day you're walking into the office and feeling like I'm not at 100%. Mm -hmm. And it's a really difficult, weird muscle to develop that you get comfortable with over time. And the way that you do that is not just like getting used to it, right? I think yeah. like a lot of people will say, you'll get used to it and that is true but the way to accelerate that and overcome that entirely is to just break it down into its smallest parts and understand all the variables at play right yeah so it's like yeah when you're reversing that pipeline number the average opportunity i need a million in pipeline the average opportunity that i have is fifty thousand yeah. dollars that means i need 20 opportunities yeah. to hit that which means if i need 20 opportunities every 30 calls that i make means one opportunity etc cetera, etc cetera, yeah. right and uh, yeah, I, I just think like this is this is the you've gotten past the honeymoon phase of like obsessing of breaking into tech sales and doing that as a career. This is like the next step where you need to go and actually indicates that you're starting to become like a professional, if you will, because you are breaking it down into this and you're not worried about I'm not at my number. You're not worried about internal politics. You're not worried about any of that shit yep. that can really clog your <clears throat> mind and get you away from the core of what you need to do. So, yeah. yeah. And there's like the metric part of this too, like falling behind your number. And I know when we're recording this, we're in a time where the economy is in a little bit of a rough spot compared to past years. The past two years, there've been quite a few layoffs. And I know there's people who get stressed out because they're not hitting their number, but there's also people who are genuinely stressed out because they're like, I'm behind my number. Am I next on the chopping block? Yeah. What I've found, the way to combat that is unless it's like a strategic decision from the business, like a riff that wasn't performance based, they're like, we're getting rid of this business unit for X, Y, Z. You can't really control that. In most other cases, when management sees that you're hyper focused on these inputs and grinding and doing everything you can to do better, they often, they're easily able to identify that. And even if you're not at your number, next time there's some sort of rearrangement in the business, they're gonna take care of you yeah. in a lot of cases. So if that's the situation you're in too, like that's the best way I've found to combat it, both in terms of getting to your number, like focusing on the inputs, but also management is gonna be able to identify that you're someone who's working hard and if someone else was in that role, they couldn't be doing more than what you're already doing. Yeah. So they're gonna end up in most cases taking care of you when the time when there's an opportunity to do so is what i've seen yeah yeah i think on the outside looking in it's you know each culture is going to be a little bit different and like i say if you if you go to a super small garbage startup like yeah. all bets are off right mm -hmm. but if you're at a decent company call it you know i don't know 100 200 as low as 100 to 200 people all the way up to the biggest companies in the world that have clear trajectory that have top performers that are hitting their number actively then there is a path to get there and i think you know to, to your point, like, I, I think a lot of people come into this, like, we don't want to give you the impression that if you miss your number for a month, you're fired. That's definitely yeah. not the case. There are teams that will for an entire year hit 60, 70% of their number. But there are also clear, like, not even on the radar perform bottom tier performers that get into this role for three to six months and they get burnt out and they just stop trying altogether. Those people get weeded out very quickly. Those are the people that don't hit their number for a month or two and they're gone. Mm -hmm. But to your point, I, I will say it's like amidst all the fear of like, what if I don't hit my quota? Like many well-oiled machines and organizations, if you're new, they wanna give you minimum six to 12 months 
to at least, as long as you're continuing to grow, continuing to put in effort, they want to see if you can at least start to correct the trend and go upwards. Mm -hmm. Maybe not even hit your number in year one, but again, the flip side, you got to think of this from their perspective. If they bring you in and they fire you within six months, they've just basically lost probably what, $30,000 of base salary yeah. pending your role, if not more, <clears throat> if you're an account executive. And now they've got to spend the next two months hiring your replacement. Mm -hmm. So just because you didn't do great early on does not mean you can't become successful. But I see a lot of people going back to an earlier point when you don't break it down into these smallest parts, when you're not trying to learn what top performers are doing and just reverse engineering this process, you get into it and you just think, well, I haven't hit in six months. I'm just not a salesperson and you're right on the cusp of like exponential returns. Mm -hmm. And so many things, especially in business and life and sales, it's like your progression early on, maybe even downwards a little bit, but you know, first six months, it's like very linear, very slow. And then you start to really ramp up month six to 12 and beyond. If you're actually pouring yourself into it, if you're taking the loss and having like really difficult conversations with yourself of like, I am not doing well and this is why, and that's okay and that's normal. I know you talked about when we were offline recording how when you were first an AE, it took you a while to kind of get going. Mm -hmm. And same thing in my case, I came in as an AE on a brand new team at this company, brand new territory. It took me about seven months to close my first deal as an account executive. But the back half of that year, I exceeded my annual quota because everything started to hit and everything that I'd been working on for that first six months started to come into fruition and really actually be able to close. Quick so. question there. Could you feel that things were coming into fruition? Because I think that's a key difference where when a lot of people enter a role and they don't close their first deal for seven months, that's a long time. Like it's, it's easy to just say seven months, but actually living through that seven <laughs> months, like that's where a lot of people who if they're not thinking about this stuff that we're talking about, they just end up quitting month three, month four, and they stop focusing on those inputs that would have then led to you yeah. hitting your number in that back half. So I guess, what was your experience yeah. like there? That's a great question too, because I also think, you know, this happens a lot early on in your career too. Like when you become an SDR, I think within three to six months, you should be very close to hitting your number consistently. And that's on you to put in work. It's not just like go through the company training. You got to be like all in on this career. And I think you can make it happen quickly. But yeah, when you first go to AE, that's where I see a lot of people drop off. And what this does to you individually and to your question is the first six months I'm sitting there, I still have kind of like a lot of naive optimism. I've mm -hmm. just been promoted. Management is telling me I'm like, I, I was an incredible SDR. They're really excited to have me as an AE and I'm doing all these things. And while it's not coming in, this is one of the phases of my career where I started acting in hindsight. I didn't like feel it in the moment, I guess, but in hindsight, I kind of started acting desperate in the sense that like I wasn't closing anything for six months. So it must be my training. Let me go buy this course. Let me go watch this video. Let me go read this book. Let me go read this book. Let me go read that book. That, yeah. And all of a sudden it's like, I didn't just appreciate that this takes, you know, in the example of moving from SDR to AE, it takes a little bit of time to get momentum and people who close stuff early are exceptions to the norm. And so, yeah, I guess when I was in it, you know, I think I, the first six months I had a lot enough optimism and like enthusiasm about the role to carry me through to where I, I wouldn't say I actively felt like I was about to get fired, but after six months, it's like, yeah, you can only hype yourself up so much. You know, luckily I got a, a pretty decent one in at that seven month mark and then a lot of stuff started to happen pretty quickly from there. Um, but yeah, it, it can be a lonely island and I see a lot of people that, especially on those early transitions from SDR to SMBAE or SMBAE to enterprise for the first time, they do it for like six to 12 months and they just didn't realize that that was kind of table stakes. You know, it's like that that's what it takes to get going. And yeah, I just see a lot of people acting desperate or thinking they're insignificant because of it. So, yep. Yeah. And up to here, we've talked a lot about controlling what you can control and focusing on the inputs, actively working to get better and optimize those inputs throughout the year to eventually start getting better results and get that uptrend. I've found that the other cure to stress is, and it's just as important as the consistency of those inputs. I, I have this saying when I was an SDR manager, I'd always tell the reps I'd, about the concept of ebbs and flows. And I always said, when it's hot, it's hot. When it's cold, it's cold. We'd be focusing on the inputs. We knew we had email templates that were effective email templates. I was listening and working with them on their cold call messaging. I knew it was good. And then it was about doing enough of it, but not just one day or two days. You can literally do all the right things for a week 
and have nothing happen. But then the next week you do the same things. You did nothing different. You just focused on those same inputs and you book five, six meetings that week. And it can stretch out longer than that. You could go two weeks with nothing. And then that third week, make up an entire month's worth of quota. I'm just talking about the SDR role here in one month. And I think you see this at every level, like even making cold calls, if you're an SDR listening, I'm, if you've made cold calls, you have, know that feeling of going 50, 60 dials without getting alive. And a lot of people would just give up. But if you're that type of person is like, no, I'm going to do a hundred every single day, no matter what, it's that 60 to 70th dial. You never know when it's going to happen. But in those 10 dials, you get like eight lives and end up booking four meetings in between them. But if you weren't not just focused on the inputs, but doing them consistently, an analogy I use, I know we talk, I, I'm a big stock market junkie. I love looking at stocks and stuff. Fun fact for the audience, the best performing stock of all time, the, la or the last 25 years, sorry, is Monster Beverage Corporation. A lot of people don't understand that. You can go look at the chart. It's up like 100,000% since 2002. It used to be Hanson's Natural Beverage, then it went to Monster. But I always point out this chart because Yes, if you held it, you'd have the best, you'd be holding the best stock of all time, but there were multiple 70 plus percent drawdowns in that stock. Like it was not a clean ride up. And it's the same thing at sales. It's never like a linear, the path yeah. to success is never just linear. You just have to focus on the inputs and some days it'll be like this, some days it'll be down there. And I just like looking at that chart because it was the same thing. It would rip, but then it would fall back. If you thought the, the world was crashing here and you sold the stock, huge mistake. Same thing in sales. You're doing all the right things, but you're not getting the results and you think, oh, this isn't working and you stop doing it. Yep. That's where you lose. Yep. You don't lose. You can't lose unless you just stop doing it. That doesn't mean you, you shouldn't be focused on optimizing and getting better. But I think that's the second key to the equation. A lot of people leave out. Yes, get better at get better at the activities that are important, those key inputs, but just as important, if not more important is can you do it for a long time, even when you're not seeing the results. Yeah, and I, I think this actually brings up a, a couple of points I want to get into. One, I'll, I'll just give an example to tie that off. But two, I also want to talk about outside of work because I, I know we're focused about the job itself. But I also think there's a healthy balance to have outside of work. And like if your life 24 seven, 365 is sales, you're just going to burn out at some point. I think it's sustainable for like a year or two. I'll get to that. Nonetheless, I would just add like in my current role, this is not a flex or intended to be like anything crazy. You know how this goes, right? Because yeah. on the backside of this, when you have a bunch of deals close at once, you get an awesome paycheck. Mm -hmm. And then the next three, four months, you have like nothing coming in, yeah. right? And so all I would say is like to, to put a real example to this, like the reason I got into sales is because I hated engineering. Engineering was not for me, to put it lightly. My first year as an engineer, I made 65,000 as a year one entry level engineer at a Fortune 1000 company. This year at my company, the first year I was ramping up, it took a ton of time to get a lot of things involved. In January, I made more in one month than I did in an entire year as an engineer. And that sounds great, and that was great. I'm very fortunate for that. But at the same time, like I, it, I, I think, yeah, there's a lot of naivete. Like I don't, I don't do that and just promote this on social media. I think there's a lot of people who would do that and just tell everyone, here's how I did this in a month or how I made this much in a year. Mm -hmm. The reality is the next four months after that, I didn't really close much at all, right? And now like this month, a lot of good deals closed. I have another healthy commission check coming in, but I, I think I wanna parlay this not to talk about you know my own finances or, or anything like that. I think the flip side of this and what a lot of people aren't ready for is when you do come into the more lucrative tracks in tech sales, enterprise account executive, even mid-market, I mean, even SMB, like you have SMB account executives making 150, 170. And if you're in your 20s, that's great money relative yeah. to like almost all of your peers, right? But if, when you start making 250, when you start making 300, et cetera, et cetera, like you'll get these checks. Like I, I have some strategic reps at our company that just closed like monster deals. They didn't make anything for 12 months yep. and they're making basically their entire salary in a single month. More power to them, credit to them. But what I would say is you on the outside looking in, glamorizing the 300K a year professional, you actually get there and it feels very different, yep. right? Like I, I think there's a lot of people that think once you get to that 300K a year role, your life is in a great position. That it's like a steady stream yeah. of income. But exactly. when it, it's very lump sum. Yeah. I think that's that stressed I think that stresses a lot of people out. I think that's the one of the biggest mind sh mindset shifts from going from SDR to AE2 is there's no more instant gratification. Like when yep. you're an SDR, 
yeah, you're not getting paid out every single time, but every time you book a meeting or every time you get an opportunity, those can happen quick. Like you can wake up one morning and not have anything going for you. And by the end of the day, set a meeting, hold a meeting, get an opportunity. And you know that directly just translated to money in your bank account yeah. where the account executive, you just have to have trust in the process. Like you can have a sales cycle that's six plus months. You're not getting paid $1 in between. Something could go wrong at any point. And it's very like, yes, the, the highs are high, but it comes in a very lump sum fashion at times. You have yeah. to be able to withstand long periods of not getting rewarded for doing the right things. Yeah. And I, I don't want to turn this into like stoicism, Marcus Aurelius <laughs> shit. But, it's, but yeah, it, it's how you combat stress though. A hundred percent. And and I think like that's the thing that I would say to other people out there. It's like the first time, like I, I've had a couple checks like exceeding like 50 grand throughout my career, which is amazing. But now when they come around, like, it's not that I take it for granted, like, don't take it that way, but it's just like, cool. You know, yeah. like, it's exciting. I might go, like, my tradition is to like have a cheat day. So I'll probably like get some Domino's pizza. Like I don't, I don't go to the yeah. steakhouse. That's not really my shtick. I enjoy that, but I like to just like, honestly get a huge workout in and then eat like shit. Like yeah. that's my <laughs> guilty pleasure for huge checks. But outside of that, it's like the second I wake up the next day, it's whatever life goes on. And don't get me wrong the overall trend of my happiness due to finances, which is not my entire way that I'm happy. But like, I will say now that I'm coming up on five years, I am five years into it is like the financial bed that I have built because of being in this career now, looking back, makes me very happy and much more at ease. Yeah. But really the first, really honestly up until now, pretty much this year, I haven't allowed myself to like celebrate or really get that confident in how much money I've made because it's like the second you do that, you take your foot off the gas, you stop trying to improve. And like, what I'm trying to say is when you get this far into it and you're actually committed to the financial upside and the career path of tech sales, like it's not going to be this huge dopamine hit all the time. Yeah. And if you're, if you're living for that huge check, if you've got it built in your mind that you going to that BMW dealership and getting mm -hmm. that car is like gonna make people give a shit about you or make you think that you're really that much greater. What's gonna happen is a year after you buy that car, you're gonna have a $3,000 repair bill for something that used to cost you $150 in your Toyota Camry. And you're like, I hate this piece of shit car that I spent 70 grand on. And you're stressed out because you just got a call from your manager, you haven't hit your number and life hits you really hard. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to say like, is it worth it? Like, do I absolutely like there is no question for me. I am built for this career. I very much enjoy this entrepreneurship, sales, business development types of things. And I think if you know what you're signing up for, it's absolutely worth it. But I, I pause if you have any thoughts there. One thing I want to tap into before we call this episode, which has been great, is also outside of work. But any other thoughts on that before we kind of transition? No, I think another way to frame what you just said is and I think you learn this naturally with experience in this industry is you can't get too high at the highs and you can't get too lows at the lows. Cause yeah. once you, it, we're not saying the first time you get a 50 K check going to be a huge dopamine. Hell yeah. Like there's no, Hell you're, yeah. that's unavoidable. <laughs> yeah. Like enjoy yeah. it. But yeah. once you do this long enough, you start to learn that you think that that next time that 50 K check is coming, anything can happen in B2B sales, especially in enterprise. There's so many moving parts. And if you let yourself get too high at the highs, you're also gonna end up getting too low at the lows. And that's where a lot of people crash and burn when they stake their entire identity on hitting their number, or like some, some huge deal that's gonna be game changing for them and then it doesn't happen and they feel like a total failure. I think you, you learn over time in this industry that I, what you were just saying, you just learn to, you don't get too high, you don't get too excited anymore. Like, yeah. because you know there's probably gonna be an equally and opposite downside coming at some point too. So you just yeah. learn to think about it in more of a moderate fashion. Yeah, well said. And I think I also, at least for me, I'd be curious, like your kind of personal philosophy for it. I don't have an exact science to this. So I don't want people to overread into it or just do shit just to do shit. But one of the things that has always helped me is not having a ton, but having like one thing outside of work that is, I mean, it could be money driven, like obviously what we do here at higher levels yeah. is a business, right? And that's been the obsession more recently in the last two, three years of my career. Early on when I first got into tech sales, not going into all of COVID, but that's what I, I started tech sales like right before COVID. And then for that weird first year, you know, we were pretty much locked in, couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And like super random, 
but I got into coffee roasting and like just having something completely outside. Some people it could be, you know, like I, I have some buddies who brew beer, uh, are into like food, whether they make it themselves or whether they enjoy fine dining. I'm not even telling you how much money you should spend on it or not, right? Like if you enjoy traveling, like you have to make a consistent effort in my opinion. I don't know exactly what it's gonna be for you. For me, like I really enjoy, because sales is like Zoom calls all day, going to customer sites, not really making anything. I really enjoy having something where I, even if it's pretty minimal, coffee roasting is actually not as intense of a process as you would think. And it's something that I have allowed my brain to just go into. You know, I find myself at 2 a.m. on like a Reddit thread or a YouTube video that has like 300 views of some random dude in his like <laughs> garage showing you how to roast coffee and all this stuff. Like it's been fun and I like have coffee roasting equipment and it's something that takes my brain completely off of it. Obviously higher levels has been a different thing. Maybe we'll leave it outside the, the topic of this because obviously you're watching it, living yeah. it right now. But I would also say like one last thing from a fitness perspective, I used to be a competitive athlete. I'm not gonna say exactly what you have to do fitness wise, but I think if you're not working out like three times a week in any capacity, forcing yourself to get outside for an hour, ideally lifting weights and or running, like I think it's gonna be really, really difficult to keep your sanity. And like as an example, I actually have a friend and you know other people in my life that put me onto skiing like the last year or two. Yeah. And something like that I absolutely love. It could be surfing, it could be just any exercise, high intensity stuff, whatever it might be. Like when you're doing something like skiing, you can't be thinking about all the problems in your yeah. deal. Like if you take your mind off of what is in front of you going 30 miles an hour on a mountain, you are gonna fall and injure yourself. And it forces you to be absolutely locked into that activity. So what th that can be many different things for many people, but find an activity that has nothing to do with sales for a second in mm -hmm. your life that what just gives you the peace of mind and ability, even if for five, 10 hours a week, you can just focus on something that has nothing to do with the day-to-day -day stress of your job. That is where I found a lot of peace and a lot of ability to balance and tolerate all of the stuff that comes with a, a yeah, tech sales job. That's critical. So, yeah. Whatever it is that gets you into flow state. Like I think moving is the easiest and most natural for people, but it doesn't necessarily have to be moving. But me naturally, I think there's a lot of people who really are on the tech sales grind. Like I'll have days where I'm literally just hunched over nine hours a day like not moving like trying to maximize the day and then i realize like well i haven't even moved today like i don't even <laughs> yeah. consciously think about it i'm like yeah. i'm going outside and i'm not leaving i'm not coming back here for three hours for me it's a mix like i like to lift weights i run i live near a beach when it's warm i play volleyball sometimes pickleball i haven't really gone deep into any of these but like i find something that yeah and you just have to because if you don't there's always just going to be this lingering thought like quota say like even when you're watching tv it's not like yeah. totally out of your mind you have to find that thing yeah. that hits flow state yeah and i would i would argue even too it's like even unless you're literally a competitive gamer that like is yeah. competing for money like i would argue like borderline get rid of like video games the last thing you want to do is have your hobby be something that's like looking at yet another, yeah, screen, another screen for another mm -hmm. four hours a day so uh but yeah th this is great man any any other thoughts on that topic too like anything i i missed no, I mean, I think this pretty much covers how I have handled stress in the past. I mean, I still get stressed. There's no mastering it. I definitely still get stressed these days. There's weeks where I'm yeah. like start to finish. Just I don't even have the time to, to get out and run. And yeah. I have to maximize that week. And maybe that's just learning better time management skills. Sometimes I think it's just unavoidable. It's yeah. part of the career. It's what you sign up for. But yeah, it's it's rewarding. No, and I, I think like I mean even for perspective, leaving out the full story, like this past year I got put on some strategic accounts. I had to fly to New York, Toronto, Chicago. There was a span of twelve weeks. I flew eleven of them to on site yeah. to visit different customers. I literally for the first time in like five years got sick because I wasn't working out. I was like out with customers, probably having not like getting drunk, but you know, over the course of a week, having two drinks a night with a customer that adds up over time, especially as you get into your thirties yeah. and like that kind of stuff you have to plan for. And I was blindsided by as well. And so you just have these ebbs and flows for months, for quarters at a time that are good and bad. And it's just part of the job. But I think compared to the stress of other jobs that maybe don't have that financial upside, um, is one side of it. You know, I know we have like nurses, we have teachers, we have people that are working their ass off dealing with different but equivalent, if not higher levels of stress that are making less. So I think in that sense, I never take for granted that the financial upside is very yeah. unique in this career. And on the flip side too, I also see people in the investment banking tracks that give 
12 hour days, six and a half days a week for the first five to seven years of their career. And I don't want that either. So for me, it's like tech sales is that sweet spot of where, sure, I've had 80 hour weeks, they're unavoidable. Sure, but most of the time I can get a lot of my work done in 40 to 50. If I'm doing, you know, working really hard, I've got a good workflow down and I can still have a very strong upside. That also allows me being a more entrepreneurial person to pursue different endeavors on the side. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, if you're a doctor, if you're an investment banker, your upside might be a little bit more pending your specialty, but at the same time, what it takes to get there, the day-to-day -day stress that you have to have going into your 40s, your 50s, your 60s is a lot. And that's why I choose tech sales. And I'm not saying it's not stressful, but for me personally, it's well worth it, especially compared to a boring engineering job that I had that I got a 3% raise after two years. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, um, this is a great episode, man. I thought we went super deep. And for everyone watching as well, like, if there's other stuff you want us to talk about, like comment below. We actively monitor that. So we'd love to have a dialogue if you have questions or other thoughts on this topic. Also, Connor's YouTube is linked in the description as well. He's part of the higher levels team, does a ton of deep dives into tech sales as well. And uh, yeah, lastly, we both are instructors at higherlevels.com. So if this YouTube video is valuable and that's all you need, more power to you. Glad you enjoyed it. But also if you're looking for an academy, live community, et cetera, we have built higherlevels.com and trained thousands of reps at the best companies in the world. But uh, any other shout outs or? Nah, man, good yeah. stuff. I'm totally relaxed now. This did, this did the trick. <laughs> yeah. right, we'll, uh, we'll see everybody next time. Mode. Namaste, dude. Yeah. <laughs>